Three True Psychopath Horror Stories Today, we're going to talk about three stories about psychopaths that will make you think twice about humanity. These stories are really creepy and will leave a lot of questions regarding human nature. Although these psychopaths attempted some cruel crimes that are not acceptable, due to proper investigation, they were caught and the world could know about them. So without further ado, let's begin our first scary story. Number 1. The story where a doctor is a psychopath will make you think before visiting a doctor. The story is about Dr. Harold Shipman, who killed about 250 patients while doing his job by the same method. Isn't it strange? He was famous for killing his patients instead of saving them. When he was 17, his mother was diagnosed with lung cancer. The doctor administered morphine to ease her pain. Harold was really impressed and that's where his interest in medicine started. After that, he married Primrose May Oxby while studying medicine at Leeds University Medical School. He had four children. His life seemed normal to anyone who looked at him. He was known as a very reputable doctor in society. He was also very hardworking. He used to attend to many patients daily compared to other doctors. He was also a family doctor, so he used to attend to patients in their homes. In his early practice days in 1976, this young doctor was found addicted to using Demerol, which is a drug used to treat severe pain. He was fired from his job and was sent to a rehabilitation center. He came back from the clinic in a short time. Everything was fine until people started noticing that whenever an old patient visited this doctor, they died after a few days. Actually, whenever an old patient came to visit him, he lied to them about having an old age disease that needed to be treated quickly. So he gave them extra doses of morphine that killed them. He always made old people his victim so that no one could doubt him as relatives understood that people die in old age, so it might not be a doctor's fault. There was a time when six patients from the same neighborhood died after Shipman's house visits and eight female patients also died in his clinic during treatment. As compared to other doctors, there was an increase in the number of deaths of Shipman's patients day by day. No one noticed his acts, but one of the local churches in the area noticed that the number of dead bodies they received was more from the patients of Shipman. They also informed the police about him, but no one could ever imagine that he could be a dangerous and psychopathic man. Once, an ex-mayor of the area visited Shipman for treatment. After visiting the doctor, she died after a few hours. Now, he was in the news and people started doubting him. The daughter of the ex-mayor was shocked when she saw that her mother wrote everything to give to Shipman in her will. She filed a complaint against Shipman at the police station. When the post-mortem of the ex-mayor was conducted, it was found that her death was due to the intake of an extra dosage of morphine. He was charged with the first murder. Other people started to file cases against him for their dead relatives. All of the bodies were diagnosed with extra dosages of morphine. Now, the total cases reached 100. Shipman was not accepting any of the charges in jail. The audit committee found that out of 500 patients, 250 died because of the extra dosage of morphine. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in 2000. In 2004, he attempted the last murder, when he used a bedsheet and fan in jail to commit suicide. That's how he took his own life. Many people say that he had a god complex and other psychotic problems, but that's how a death doctor killed a lot of patients. Number 2. This story will leave you shocked and chilled in horror because it is no less than a horror movie that you watch at 3 a.m. In Plainfield, Wisconsin, a man, Ed Jean, used to hear the voices of his mother that convinced him to kill people. He used to read the local newspapers and read about all the deaths that happened in the city. He was especially interested in the deaths of young girls. After getting information from the newspaper, he used to visit the graves of those girls and dismember their bodies. After that, he used to collect his favorite body parts. His house was full of human skin and bones, he used to make chairs, lockets, and lampshades from these body parts. Wisconsin was a quiet area until 1957. 
Some of the investigators went into the area to check out about some satanic activities happening in the area. But the truth was more horrifying than one could imagine. A woman who used to have a shop in the area was missing. Police found a pool of blood at the scene of the crime. After investigation, they reached Ed Jean's house. They saw the lady's body hanging without a head. They found her head in a cloth. Her heart was wrapped in a plastic bag. When they looked around, they found 10 human skulls. Walls were covered with the face skins of the same skulls of women. Only one room was clean, which was his mother's room. His mom was also a very rude lady who hated men. After her death, he started to hear his mom's voice and saw other hallucinations. He started to believe that he could revive his mother. He started to steal dead bodies from graves and started to make things out of them. He was found mentally insane and a psychopath by police and doctors. He spent the rest of his life in the mental hospital, and in 1984, he died of cancer. Whenever someone asked about his mother in the mental hospital, he said that there was no one like his mother. According to the doctors, Ed Jean was unable to distinguish between reality and his imaginative world, and that's why he attempted such psychopathic crimes. Number 3. So, here is the story of a priest who was a devil inside. You might have heard of The Nun and other scary movies like that, but have you heard about a priest being a devil inside? We are talking about James Porter, who started his priesthood at an early age. Along with being a priest, he was also molesting children and abusing them secretly. The fact that Father Porter was able to abuse so many children over the course of his career is a sobering reminder of the power dynamics at play in situations of sexual abuse. Abusers often use their position of authority and trust to manipulate and control their victims, and it can be difficult for victims to come forward and be believed. In April 1960, he was assigned to a parochial grammar school in St. Mary's in charge of altar boys. His behavior was bad from the start regarding children. No one took notice of his actions. About three to four parents did a complaint against his behavior. Instead of informing the police, the church transferred him to a parish in Fall River. Further complaints were received about him. Father James Porter's pattern of abuse was truly horrifying. His action caused untold harm to his victims and their families, and it is clear that the church failed in its duty to protect the vulnerable members of its community. It is deeply troubling to think that Father Porter was allowed to continue his abuse for so long, even after he was arrested for molesting a 13-year-old boy in 1964, he was able to return to the church and continue his abuse. This is due in part to the systemic failures of the church, which prioritized the reputation of the institution over the safety of children. After his release, Father Porter was sent to a parish where he was supposed to receive psychotherapy. However, it appears that his therapy was inadequate and he was soon declared mentally stable and allowed to return to preaching as a priest. This allowed him to continue his abuse for many more years, despite the fact that there were many more complaints made against him. It is clear that the church failed to take the appropriate steps to protect children from Father Porter's abuse. Instead of reporting him to the authorities and ensuring that he was held accountable for his crimes, he was moved from parish to parish and given inadequate treatment. This highlights the urgent need for better safeguards and accountability measures within the Catholic Church and other institutions to protect children from abuse. In 1973, he left the priesthood and he admitted that he molested children. After that, he was married and had four children. He was also abusive toward them. In 1990, Frank Fitzpatrick told the public that he was molested by Porter in his childhood. Police were not agreed to take his case so he asked a lawyer to help him. He gathered other victims, and soon, all the people that were his victims started to speak in public. He was arrested for abusing children and was given six months imprisonment. But later, a lot of complaints were reported, and due to this, he was sentenced to 18 to 20 years in prison. He was charged with 200 counts of sexual abuse. Later on, he died because of cancer in 2005. It is important that we continue to shed light on cases like Father Porter's and to hold those responsible accountable for their actions. By doing so, we can help to prevent future cases of sexual abuse and protect the most vulnerable members of our communities. That was all for today's video. What have you learned from these creepy stories? 
What are your thoughts on these psychopaths? Tell us in the comments section. Thanks for watching.